Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the North Andover School Committee meeting for June 1st, 2017. Our first order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance, so I'd invite everyone to stand and pledge allegiance to me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, just as a reminder, we are being recorded and we're on TV tonight, so please silence your mobile devices if you have them in the audience. Our first order of business tonight is public comment. Does anyone in the audience want to give public comment to the school committee? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on to recognition. Um, I guess we can combine recognition with student report. Would that be appropriate, Madam Vice Chair, you think? I think it would be absolutely Okay. Nice. Courtney, would you come forward, please? And uh, we'll, we'll first, we'll let you give your last and final report. We thought last time was your last and final report, but I understand that you were pressured by. Yeah, she came into my cooking <laughs> class and like grabbed me by the neck with a knife <laughs> and was like, Courtney, you better come to the next school committee okay. meeting. Okay. Just kidding. Got some nurses behind you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm excited to be here again for one last time. I made a false statement last time saying it would be my last meeting, but Dr. Price encouraged me to come to this one. Um, nothing much has happened, especially because I haven't been in school this past week. <laughs> but next week, we're starting off our senior week with a movie night on Sunday and ending it with graduation. It's bittersweet leaving high school, but I'm sure the underclassmen are very like sad that we're leaving, especially because there's so much parking space is left for them. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Well, I know we all sang your praises last uh, two weeks ago, and I just want to reiterate that. You've been a, a great representative uh, for you. the high school, so uh, you served your, your peers very well. Um, I'm going to let the, uh, the vice chair make a presentation and recognition at this point. So, um, Courtney, on behalf of all of us, we wanted to thank you for your outstanding service. Um, we're going to miss seeing you and your wonderful updates and not only what you do here, but what you do in our high school. Thank so for that, we want to thank you and the small gift. Thank you so much. And we wish you all the best and hope you come back and wave from the audience sometime. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It's Cole on his we'll way. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's Cole <laughs> on his way. <laughs> They're giving out gifts? I'll get there. <laughs> You we'll, see you, we'll see you next week. We'll see you next week, Courtney. That's right. Okay. Oh, that'd be great. Oh, that's good. We should awesome. have Perfect. Thanks, Courtney. Bye. Okay, what a great kid. All right. Um, consent agenda. Approval of minutes um, from May 16th, 2720. <laughs> I know they're very detailed minutes. Um, this was the meeting prior to town meeting. Um, do they appear correct? They are correct. Uh, if that's the case, I would accept a motion at this point. So moved. Moved by Ms. Picard, seconded by, Second. by Ms. Lynch to approve the minutes as presented in the packet for May 16, 2017. All those in favor say aye. 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 There are no no's. 4 0 vote. Okay. Uh, quick cheers report tonight. Um, I was fortunate to participate uh, today uh, with Dr. Price and uh, special guest parents by the, the vice chair. Of the school committee, Miss Mabley wasn't wasn't on the the roster to. I to thought I was participate. just an audience member. So no, we dragged you right to the front. So we had uh, North Andover Middle School at Civics Day, Day today, and wow, it's loud. Um, Mr. McGravey did a heck of a job bringing people from the state government, uh, local government, and our judicial system to speak to all the eighth graders, and uh, I found it very in informative. Uh, got some great questions. The biggest one probably being why we don't have AC at the middle school. Um, but other than that, there was a, a lot of good discussion, a lot of good debate about uh, our government and um, how to get involved. Um, can you comment on that, Dr. Price, as well? Yeah, it was just a wonderful opportunity to talk to kids about the importance of local government, which was myself, Mr. Tracy, Ms. Mabley, uh, our town moderator, and our town manager. So it was just a, a fun, a yeah, fun opportunity to, you know, make it real. Um, just a reminder: the graduation, as Courtney mentioned, is next Friday, January 9th. I believe everyone should have RSP by now. Um, in, on, in front of you have a little parking thing to put on your dashboard so you can Which park. Which you want. You, what you want, yeah, it's kind of a... There's one for Mr. McDevitt. When he gets here, he can have all his, all his stuff right I there. Mean, you have to park down the whole room across. Yeah. The um, <laughs> also, scholarship night is next uh, Wednesday the 7th as well. 
And the other announcement is the Kittridge Playground. I think you guys should have got that invitation is next Friday morning at 845 as well. Um, those are just uh, dates that are coming up. An update from the school building committee, as you know, um, I'm, I don't know if you know, I'm, I'm chairing that, that school building committee. Uh, we met last week and we met again uh, tonight, moving very quickly because we have a very uh, strict and ambitious timeline for that. So um, it's going really well. We have a great, great group of people that the moderator appointed at the end, as well as the people we, were, we appointed. Um, I guess as, as we go along, I will give you um, updates. If the, the chair at the time allows me to speak, um, I'll be happy to give you school building committee updates going forward. But uh, just as a, a point of matter, we did vote to hire KBA architects. The, the school building committee is responsible for, for hiring an architect and an OPM, an owner's project manager. So we hired uh, KBA architects tonight, as well as we hired NV5 to be our owner's project manager. So um, that was a, a good step in the right direction. And I know that uh, Dr. Price and Mr. Mealy have put a lot of time and effort into working with those two, uh, those two outfits. And I think we have some good people on board for that. So we have a bunch of meetings next week. So I, I would assure you that next meeting um, on the 15th, I will have a, a good update on, on where we stand. We have uh, some meetings with the teachers coming up. We have some meetings with the other department heads to see how they fit <coughs> into this equation. So uh, a lot going on with, this, with the kindergarten uh, building. And that's it for my chair's report. Um, Superintendent. A lot happening in the North Andover Public Schools. It feels like we are racing towards the finish, not easing in, I would say, to the end. Is that fair? I'm looking at my assistant superintendents. Um, a few announcements. Uh, Mr. Jackson just announced to the community that uh, we have two new assistant principals at the high school. Um, Scott Young, our current uh, assistant principal for athletics, is going to become a full-time assistant principal. And we're bringing in a woman by the name of Brooke Randall, who is currently a dean at Peabody High School. So uh, I just want to let you know that. Um, we will have an appointment of our AD by next week. We have two finalists. Um, Mr. Gilligan and I walk through some uh, practices today with one candidate. We'll be walking through practices tomorrow with another candidate. Um, so that will kind of round out the high school leadership restructuring that we've been talking about since December when we first started talking about the budget. Sorry, in January. Um, and then, as many of you know, just um, we, uh, Dr. Ed Foster uh, has accepted a position as a middle school principal in Lowell. We're very excited for him. Uh, and we have um, launched a full search uh, to find his replacement. We went, met with parents last night. Dr. Donna Strait and um, Carrie Wahlberg are going to be chairing that committee. Uh, we met with parents at Sargent last night for an hour and a half, and early, bright and early this morning, we met with a faculty of Sargent to talk about the process and to also talk about um, what we're looking for in the next principal of Sargent. The job has been posted. It closes on June 9th, and our plan is to have finalists in the school on the we last Wednesday and Thursday of school with an appointment before the end of school. So as I said, it's not like we're easing in to the yeah. end. Um, a <laughs> yes. Um, a few updates. I, we, sorry, we were a few minutes late. We were just watching the tennis team, which I, I couldn't quite tell how they fell at the end there in a state tournament. I think they might have not pulled it out. Um, we watched the baseball team, unfortunately, lose to Salem. Um, and I just got word from Hingham that Eric Duffy um, – broke his own state record and won the state tournament today, the all-state tournament in pole vault. So that is incredibly exciting that we have the uh, pole vault champion of all of Massachusetts. And that's all state, so that's all divisions. Wow, fantastic. So pretty exciting uh, time for North Andover. Um, the girls lacrosse team, upon our departure, was winning 5 nothing in their first round of the tournament. And the boys lacrosse team plays uh, on Saturday. Very exciting. And we have 10 students going to the all-state track, um, plus Eric. Great. There we go. Thank you, Dr. Price. Okay, under old business. Um, uh, so, do so you okay. want to take new business first just because we have visitors? And would, you, would you like me to do yeah, that? Do you mind? I just feel like... Is that uh, all right, Mr. Tracy? That's ab I'm absolutely sorry, all right. I ask no, you don't need to ask. That's fine. That's fine. I think um, you're talking about the annual, talk about the annual yeah, health report today? That would be... Yeah, we yeah. can go right to new business then. Um, so annual health report, Dr. Price. So I'm going to turn this over to uh, Cheryl Barzak and team. Three nurses are going to come up as well. Sorry, I should say that. That's okay. 
I don't think we need a motion to take things out of order. I think we have that kind of discretion. So yeah, there we go. That That's discretion. our thank you. I appreciate it. We have guests. Let them. And then. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll bank that. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you for the school district and the health support each year here in June. Um, everyone has the. Well, there it is up on the screen too. Thanks, Jim. Um, first, to talk about the mission of the North Ann Arbor School Nurses, of course, to um, improve the health and academic success of all students. And in this way, there's no student that can't be in school because of a health reason because we have nurses in all of our buildings and um, we keep them all in school in a safe um, and secure environment. But just one thing I wanted to say, to everybody about the school nurses in North Andover that I don't think they always get enough credit not just in North Andover with all of our students but statewide um, they really are a group that other communities look to and they're often asked to um, share best practices with the entire state Betsy just recently um, last month shared a best practice which she's going to talk a little bit about um, actually you've been invited as well and I think Dr. Chan even was for best practices for school physicians um, so they really are highly engaged in the school nursing profession and um, oh sure sorry is that all right <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure that I, I said that tonight so um, so to move on to number two the health office visits so far this year up until today actually this number is up is updated <coughs> You know, we've had 53,531 students that have come to a school nurse. And this doesn't include um, regular screenings. It doesn't include vision and hearing or um, screenings. These are students that needed to come to the nurse for um, some type of a health reason. And I think it was five years ago I was here and um, mentioned that the number of visits was the number of seats at Fenway Park because it was about 39,000. So that's how much the nursing um, health office visits have increased. Um, our staffing has stayed pretty lean. We, we've increased a little bit because of some grants, but we really um, do see a lot of students and, and a lot of pretty um, complex health-related uh, um, issues that, that the nurses do see um, daily. Um, the return to class rate, though, is 95% because, again, one of our goals is to keep all of these students in school. and so. Uh, every year we're able to do that um, with the staff that we have and and that's you know what we're trying to do keep all the kids in school I did want to put medication management on there the 13,887 doses because uh, that's an, another important aspect of the the role of the school nurse because in addition to being in the school environment we still have nursing licenses and when you give a medication to a student there's eight things you have to think about is it the right patient the right medication the right dose the right route and there's a lot of um, chance for error and that's why the Department of Mental Health I mean the Department of Public Health sorry um, really pays attention to safety and staffing issues and um, so they've been on me a little bit like how am I going to increase the staff and I we use the grant as best we can um, but they really want to see two nurses at the high school um, now right now we use the grant to do that so I'll get to that the grant we're in the last year of that this year um, and Stan's not here, but he always asks me what percentage of students visit the health office at least once, and so that's 86 percent. Um, so of our five, almost 5,000 students, 86 percent of them do visit um, the school nurse. Again, not for screening, just for other reasons. So number three, that kind of gives a list of the different types, um, reasons that the students visit the health office, and I, I just highlighted three in red because of the change from last year. Of course, as we've all talked about many times, the increase in social emotional needs of our students um, is really shown in the nurse's office as well. It's definitely a safe and supportive environment and the students certainly use that as you can see by those numbers. Under cardiovascular, that's blood pressure uh, measurements and these are just students, not staff numbers. Um, and we did have under emergency um, 10 uh, 911 calls this year. Six of them were students and two were um, EpiPens. So those were, you know, students that lives were saved because of the EpiPen that was provided because of a food allergy reaction. Um, the others were seizures and um, I think one was an asthma situation. 
Under endocrine, um, a lot of our students that have diabetes would be under that category. Uh, we have 16 students, and it's another big part of the nursing role because they, um, to really keep them in school, they have to be managed closely. And, you know, 3,261 visits for that, just those 16 students. Um, the nurses also have to keep up with technology because there's a lot of new technology in that area that, um, that our students utilize. The rest are pretty self-explanatory, musculoskeletal, that's your sprains and uh, events on the playground. Um, neurological on page two, that's your students that have headaches. Um, we also still monitor for concussions, and that's pretty much stayed the same this year. There will be some new regulations. Um, we approve the policy every year, and we haven't changed it yet, but we might be changing it next year. There's some new um, research that's showing that students don't have to spend so much time in a quiet, dark environment, and that maybe some aerobic activity might be good as well. So we'll follow that. Dr. Chan will be involved in making decisions on how we might change that policy for the future. Respiratory would be students um, that have asthma and allergies. We have 445 students with asthma in our community, 305 with allergies, um, food allergies. Um, and just under other, I just want to make a tiny point, um, head checks for pediculosis, that's head lice. And although we get a lot of parents that talk about that, if you see the number, it's really quite low compared to like the other reasons that students come to visit. Um, under four, nursing communications. Uh, nurses spend a lot of time talking with parents. Um, and I just wanted to, another just a little kudos to nursing. The last 15 years, nurses have been nationwide have been considered the most trusting profession and parents like to talk to the nurse and the nurse um, obviously communicates effectively with them uh, for, for students. Um, the other numbers I've pretty much covered, there's you know 1,547 students with special health care needs, 382 health care plans, and on the next page, um, screenings. There's another role of school nurses is all of these screenings that are in, the, in this um, table. Postural screening, that's your scoliosis screening in grades five through nine. Uh, hearing screening and vision screening, I put that in red as well because, I mean, 237 students that have a problem with vision, I mean, that's important because you have to be able to have good vision see in order to succeed in school. So um, I think that's an important screening that the nurses do in grades one through five seven and ten. And in grade nine, um, starting in 2013, we were one of the pilot schools. Again, our nurses agreed to do that when DPH asked, you know, who would volunteer to pilot a program. And uh, Lauren with the high school guidance department started um, screening for SBIRT um, for, you know, adolescents with, um, you know, to monitor high risk for or early risk for substance abuse. And the law that I link here, starting in the fall, we have to add seventh grade, um, and we'll be doing that in the middle school as a regular screening. So to date at the high school, we've screened 1,118 students, and really it's a conversation that the guidance counselors and nurses have with the students, and it really promotes prevention and identifies this early risk for substance abuse, and that way we can take action, um, and of those, We've had 90 that had a brief intervention to kind of help the students that could have a potential or have some risk. And then we did have to refer three students, or four actually total. So I think it's a good uh, program. We'll have to introduce that to the middle school parents starting uh, in the fall. And we'll do a letter and um, allow them to opt out if they want to. Health education is another big component. That's under the next table. And this goes through the different grades and what um, the nurses cover in all of those grades. And in grade four, stress and anxiety management, I'm going to let Betsy talk about that in a minute um, and what that, that was a new program that they implemented in all the elementary schools this year. And Kathleen Pease for grade six um, started a pilot CPR program. It's already done in grade nine. Lauren McDonald does that for every ninth grader. But she's going to just kind of give an overview of what happened there. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is the grant, um, the $82,100, that grant we've had now for about 10 years, and this is the last year. 
14,000 goes to our partner schools, so we have about 68,000 that mostly we use for staffing um, so that we can try to keep two nurses at the high school and the middle school, uh, an extra nurse at the sergeant school two days a week, and an extra nurse at Atkinson two days a week. Um, it also does fund some conferences. It funds the CPR training that we do for staff, some of our technology. Um, the second grant that we received this year was a collaboration with nursing, the health department, the um, police department, and the wellness department at the middle school. And that um, we did just get our first $5,000. And so the middle school nurses and wellness teachers are being trained next week. And they will be implementing that starting for all wellness classes um, at the middle school in September. So that's great. It's a two-year grant. Um, and again, it's an evidence-based prevention program because we certainly want to try to get ahead of the um, opioid and substance abuse problems uh, in the state. And so I'm going to let Lauren and Bar Bobby talk about their innovation care coordination grant that the two of them wrote on their own and um, have implemented. So when I'm, I'm feel free to butt in. <laughs> okay. So you butt in, use the I'm, I'm in sick, so I kind of lost my voice. So it comes and goes. <laughs> Speak. Yes, so it's called the Innovative Care Coordination Project. And when this grant came up, Lauren and I decided to apply for it because we saw it as a means to improving the care of students with mental health issues and to improve communication between the stakeholders in the care of students with mental health issues. We've long known as North Andover School Nurses that early identification of mental health problems and proper referral can result in increased academic success, better emotional and physical development. So in the North Andover Public School District, there's been a marked increase in the amount of students seeking treatment for somatic complaints, a surge in the number of students who have been hospitalized for suicide ideation and attempts, and an escalation in the number of students who are absent with symptoms of anxiety and depression. Research has shown and so does common sense, really, that coordinated support of students with mental health issues improves their attendance, connectedness to school, and readiness to learn. And we also saw the need to develop programming to educate staff working with these students and to facilitate a partnership with mental health providers that are involved in the care of our students. So with the appointment of our new Assistant Superintendent of Student Services and now the Assistant Superintendent of Social and Emotional Learning, the nurses saw an opportunity to establish more solidly our role in working with guidance and the SPED department. So we always felt a little fractured, and yet we see the same students, and we work with the same students, and we provide services to these students. So our goals were to create a district-wide continuum of care for students with behavioral needs. And basically, we had a lack of system-wide procedures um, that was a, which really staff helped identify working with students with behavioral health and academic issues. And then the nurses identified that they were not always notified of IEP meetings, 504 meetings, SAT meetings, or even more importantly, re-entry meetings for students who were either uh, outplaced temporarily or hospitalized. So nurses, um, so we decided that one of the biggest roles of this grant was to improve the re-entry process for students who are outplaced or hospitalized and re-enter the school district. So we worked basically together all year trying to um, really provide some kind of a system where we're all on the same page, we're all going to talk together, we're all going to know who these students are that need these mental health services. So our outcomes were um, we developed a, and we did work with um, Donna. She was really helpful. And she's still with us trying to finish out what we, what we need to do. <laughs> but it's, it's sometimes daunting, some of the things we ask her to do. But <laughs> um, she's good. But we did, the outcomes we got out of this grant were we developed a procedure for staff notification of IEPs, 504s, SATs, and reentry meetings. So now there's a procedure that every nurse, guidance person, SPED person that's involved with these students will know who they are and be notified of their meetings. We also developed a procedure for continuity of behavioral and health information from program to program, school to school, participation in summer school programs. We found that 
we had kids that were, let's say, in our district going to summer school in our district, and there was no communication to what their health needs were, leaving those people in the, in the summer school program at a loss as to what to do and how to work with these kids. So we've now developed a procedure for that. We also developed a behavioral health student reentry procedure so that basically it will come from guidance and there are steps that guidance would take to make sure that everybody was notified. We also developed a behavioral reentry checklist to make sure that we did all those things. And then the biggest thing that we feel is really one of the most important things is we developed a behavioral health reentry to school referral. So every time a student goes out, we make contact with the, with the program or the hospital where they are. They fill all that out. So when the child reenters and there's a reentry meeting, all those people who are involved with that student coming back know what to do because a lot of these kids come back with pretty serious problems. So this will help us really keep them in the loop and not be lost somewhere in the, in the shuffle. So it's our plan to introduce these procedures to guidance, nursing, and SPED staff during one of the first two PDA, PD days in August. And then the procedures will then be used during the 2017 2017-18 school year and then we will evaluate in the spring of 18 to make sure that the process that we wanted to put in place is effective. Um, we have the grant for another year which we're thrilled to do. So these are our plans and our goals for next year is to develop a process for evaluating a student who needs to access mental health services. Right now we're all all the schools are working on a on kind of like a different, well, it's the same kind of level, but we don't have a really concise procedure in place. So this would help us if a child develops some kind of a, um, a problem in school, mental health problem in school, we'll have a process. Well, do we, what do we need to do? If a, if a child presents like this, what do we do? If it presents like this, what do we do? So there won't be any question for anybody as to how we can uh, meet the need of that student. We also um, want to work with the Assistant Superintendent of uh, Social Emotional Learning to begin to, to develop partnerships with community health resources and services. Healthcare for students of all ages, mental health services are very hard to find. Um, there was a, a parent at one of our meetings who said, I don't know how many people I tried to reach out for my daughter and they don't take Medicaid. So she was at a loss because she had no private insurance and she couldn't find a Medicaid provider. So um, we would really like to try to work and see if we can get some community resources to work with us so that we have our own little kind of group that we can refer to get help for the, the students. Um, we also were thinking of developing mental health rounds for staff centering about, about best practices in working with students with mental health workers. And, we, and in the schools, and we plan to work with our two assistant superintendents, um, Donna and our, our new lady, who I do not know the name. Director of Student Services. Just want to be clear, it's not another assistant superintendent. Oh, director. Director, director. Social, social emotional social learning. learning. Oh, director. Yeah. Okay. Thank. I just you. want anyone out there saying you like added another assistant superintendent. So Donna is the assistant superintendent for student services, and Nikki Murphy will be working under her as the director of social and, emotional learning. And do you learning. know that's really good because we are working on an organizational chart yes. because we don't know. <laughs> yes. So thank you, thank you. So we'll just be to, working because the school too. committee was going. You added another assistant We're superintendent. Yeah. Yes. So, a, yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so we have a, a, a wonderful opportunity with this grant to really, um, you know, kind of beef up our pull mental health together. services. Yeah. yeah, pull it together and our, for our students. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So thank you for your time. about what you see reflected in the statistics the nurses have all been acutely aware of and concerned about the increase in numbers of students presenting uh, um, presenting in our offices with, for social emotional reasons and at the same time realize that um, we share caseloads with 
our school counselors. And many of us are seeing the same students, whether they present with a somatic complaint of a headache or stomach ache or whatever. But all of us are concerned about, you know, trying to help kids stay in class, stay in school. So we talked about it in the fall with the counselors and started um, talking about the idea of maybe collaborating together to create a curriculum for the students to sort of help them learn how to identify stress, um, recognize stress, and most importantly, how to maybe manage stress, like come up with some strategies so that maybe they wouldn't have to come to the nurse um, when they were feeling some stress in school. So um, we worked throughout the school year, and we developed a really great curriculum. Um, and I think the outcomes were measured pretty successfully with our surveys. We, we developed a pre-survey and a post-survey to kind of measure what they knew already and then a post-survey to see what they had learned from our class. And it was kind of cool because they used their Chromebooks and we ha had access to Google Classroom. So they were able to take the surveys online and we came up with some beautiful pie chart graphs to picture it all. So as you can see from um, your notes there, do you know what stress is? Before we taught the class, 76%, which I thought was pretty high, um, thought they knew what stress was, but then after the class, it went up to 91. Can stress sometimes be good? Um, that was really important to me because I feel like most kids don't understand that stress can actually be an adaptive mechanism and can be useful in school. So um, we wanted to measure that. So before we taught the class, we found that 32% thought that was true, and then afterwards, 81%. Is stress normal? 85% before they took the class um, thought it was normal, where 97% so thought that was pretty successful. And then I know what to do when I feel stressed, which is probably the most important part. 55% thought they knew what to, how to handle their stress before we spoke with them, and then afterwards it was 76 so it'll be interesting to see you know, next year whether these fourth graders, it was a fourth grade group we targeted to, see whether there's any decrease in the number of, of um, absent days and visits to the nurse. But overall, it was really good. It was a great collaborative effort, and I hope that it's just the first of many other successful attempts. Was information about that curriculum shared with parents as well? I, I bet their numbers mm -hmm. could go up. Yes. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Becky. I think that it's all about our grade six pilot with CPR. Yes, um, four or five years ago, Cheryl recruited and encouraged me to get certified as a CPR instructor, and um, now it's sort of turned into my thing. I love it. I love to teach CPR. Um, so uh, Lauren has a program at the high school for ninth graders. This is uh, Beth and I are in our se finishing our second year at the middle school and sort of had some ideas of things we wanted to work on and one of my personal goals was to get CPR into the middle school. Um, we work really closely with the PE teachers and I had mentioned it to Kyle Wood, I don't know, a long time ago and he walked in and said, so what are we doing? Are we going to do CPR? And I was like, uh, yeah, we are. Let's do it. And it just came together like that. Cheryl gave us the support we needed, coverage in my office and we talked to American um, Heart Association and got an appropriate program for sixth graders. It's hands only. It's really the basics. It's an introductory course. Um, I, I wish I had done the before and afters. I have to say from just the feedback we got from both students, teachers, and parents, I would say it was a successful program. I feel like it's really important. Um, I think with our kids in technology, I mean, you see three-year-olds programming TVs, they can learn how to call 911 by sixth grade and recognizing an emergency. Statistics show large percentage increase in survival rate when 911 is called, CPR is given. Um, research shows if kids learn CPR as kids, they're more likely to continue it as adults, which means for us as a community, the more kids we have, the more adults we're going to have. You know, we're a heart smart community, which means we have AEDs. We told the kids that every um, police car, every fire truck has the AED. We talked about where they can find them in town. Just awareness, like really just opening it up to them. Um, I have to say, I could never be a teacher. I was absolutely exhausted <laughs> at the end of the week. Um, 
I think it's a, a hard job, but I was thrilled to have the opportunity to be in that position and work um, with our middle schools doing something that I feel is so important and I think we all know is a critical life skill. So I appreciate the opportunity and um, Kyle and MB Chisler and Beth and I will continue to work and sort of make this part of our curriculum hopefully in the future. You said it's hands only. Can you explain that? Sure, so CPR has two components, the cardio and the pulmonary resuscitation, so replacing heart and lung function. American Heart Research shows that, you know, they look at all of the data of who got CPR, who got what kind. Oftentimes, outside of the hospital, people aren't comfortable or aren't able to do the resuscitations, but the research shows that hard and fast compressions are what matters. You already have oxygen in your blood cells at the time of your event, so when you're doing your compressions, hands only, you know, if you're in a hospital setting, if you have an oxygen tank, if you're trained to give proper mouth to mouth and get chest wall rise, which means that the oxygen's actually getting in, that's excellent. But circulating the oxygen rich blood with compressions only still increases survival rates. And really for us, we're talking about buying time. I mean, none of us can actually save a person in a major cardiac event. But if you follow the instructions, which are call 911 and do compressions, um, the police tell us, what, four to five minutes to get to any school in town? So that's like two rounds of compressions. So whether it's a nurse doing it, we work really hard to get staff, coaches, administration trained. Um, Lauren and her crew does it in the high school, and now we're doing it with middle schoolers. So thank you. Yeah, Six sure. mouth to mouth might cause some other problems. Yes. <laughs> Sixth grade and mouth to mouth is yeah. not a good combination. I would have lost them. Like so, we just stuck to what we knew was effective and appropriate. <laughs> Thank you. Introductory courses. Good idea. Thanks, Kathy. It's great. It's what very well received. Um, kind of on line with that is the um, new regulation for July of 2018, Bill S. Two four four nine where every school needs to have an AED um, as well as somebody, a provider on site for basically any event, curricular or extracurricular event. Um, but I linked there our device tracking log. So we already have 15 AEDs in our community, or in our just our school district. Um, so all the schools at least have one. High school has three, um, five, well, including the fields as well. So um, we're in really good, good shape with um, where we have our AEDs. Um, the next thing, I just wanted to kind of talk about Medicaid billing. Um, the nurses started in December to, um, using our electronic medical record, we're able to uh, provide the information to our New England billing uh, service. And just from December through March, just the nursing direct services claims was $31,000 to come back to the district. So. Not only do we keep kids in school and safe, we also recoup some costs of our nurses, um, provide a safe and supportive environment, and have a staff that is um, ridiculously highly engaged in their school nursing profession. So thanks. Thank you. Great presentation. Any questions? Oh, open it. Oh, oh questions. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, get out of that or quickly. <laughs> Any questions from the committee this lunch? Okay. I think it's fantastic. Great job. Thank you. Ms. Bailey? Yeah, Coach, just a couple small things. Incredibly exciting. I love all this information. It's really helpful. And it, it's, um, you really address the areas where you've seen increases, and that's important. A um, couple things. I know having been in on the nurse's office working on something else a couple of times, I see a lot of kids coming in f just for a snack. Like, do you? even bother logging that under any so of these that's, categories? That's a or? really good question. Last year we logged yes. it to see how many students um, were coming in. Right. And then they started the food rescue program. Right. I, I, yeah. And that whole idea was to try to decrease that. So a couple schools still do record that. So that is noted in that nutrition I wasn't number. sure if it fell in anywhere here. Right. So that's under nutrition. Okay. I don't know what page it, it is a here. Nutritional um, assessment? Yeah. Or? Right. So there were still 4,000. Yeah. Um, but now we're going to not track that. So there'll be hopefully 4,000 less. Right. So if someone year. just comes in strictly, right. I want an so apple So the middle school and high crackers, school do not don't. count that. But right. some of the elementary schools do. continue. Thompson right. does continue That's to where count I, that. 
saw the right. The I didn't line realize she was through. still counting that. I don't know if she yeah. is or not, yeah, but I've seen now, the but kids. She won't be starting right, next right. year. And I think also to add that some of those nutritional assessments are not just coming in. For no, right. it's right. toward diabetes or toward other right. things, yeah. right? Right. Some of them are, you know, like the, um, you know, dehydration or something. right. Or a reason to start a conversation with a right. nurse. Yes. But yes. Yeah. Right. But so in terms of. But if a, I, I, I'm, sh I'm sure right, but that's there true. will be some decrease because right. we're not going to track that at all because now we're even trying to. I mean, now at the high school and middle school, they just have a basket. That's right. And right. they just, you know, they don't even that's have great. to ask the nurse for it. They just come in and take it. And even the superintendent occasionally. <laughs> oh, which, which is, is uh, I mean, another shout out to that program. It's it's really great because it's it's health healthy foods. It's right. Apples and oranges and fruit Famous. and. And they yeah. really we have some students that say, do you have grapes today? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> what's what's on the menu? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. There's grapes. You have that nutritional assessment under two um, topics, under D and under G. Under, so um, D is specifically yes. for the students with diabetes. Okay. So G is the... Is the um, my other question was, so I love the idea of um, CPR in the middle school. Um, in the high school, is it done through the wellness class, everybody, like the fitness health class, or what yeah, is it done? When they have life skills, yes. life skills, I take them out, and um, it's a two-day training. Okay. And we have them, I have them for two, two, two days in a row, and if they're there both days, they get certified. That's when they do it, yeah. Certification. Right, that's fantastic. So, um, ninth grade. Ninth grade, yes, okay. Yes, I wasn't sure, because I know there are a couple required classes in ninth grade, so it's under the um, life yes, skills so one. All life skills, okay. So. Right, right. No, that's that's fantastic. Uh, and then last, you mentioned that for fourth grade, um, the stress and anxiety. Were those the kids who did the survey with every fourth grader, or just kids who had come in with anxiety every fourth grader? Okay, great. And each elementary school did that. Right. That's that's very exciting too. Yeah, love all this. Thank you. So I want to thank you for the the prior year comparison. That's really helpful, especially being new to the committee and you know being able to see where the big changes are. Um, so one question I do have is um, you have noted Massachusetts recommended school nurse um, student ratio is one nurse to 500 students. Are we at that ratio now? Or not even close. Not even close. How far are we from that ratio? <laughs> well, it's five. How many, how many nurses are there? So we have 8.2 FTEs right now. But it, it goes by building, so yeah. on, you know you can have a building with only 300 students, but you still have to have a nurse. Right. So you can't just go by the total number. So really, we should have two at the high school, two at the middle school, two FTEs. Um, they actually requested 2.4 at the high school, but I think two's safe, um, and, w and we'll get there using the grant. So okay. As long as we have the grant, we're, we'll be okay for next year. But um, I'll be. Hmm. You yeah, know, and I, mean, I, I really appreciate all that work We're going to do the right thing. On. We're always going to be safe. We're very safe right now. Good. Um, and if we weren't, we would ask for help and we would get it. Uh, yeah, and we would want to know that. Right. You know, if, they, if you needed help, if we needed to be paying attention to that. Um, I appreciate all the work that you do on grants. Um, you do mention here that you've had this grant for about 10 years and this is the last year of the grant. Is it likely that there's going to be another grant so, that you uh, can? So the, the RF, what is it called, the RFP or RFR is this fall. So okay. I'll be writing another grant. <laughs> okay, terrific. Well, thank you again again yeah. for doing that. Um, and then, you know, we've talked about the increasing um, complexity of our student body and, uh, you know, how, the increase that you have here. I'm wondering, is that new students coming in or students that we've had all along who are developing new challenges or um, is there anything we can be doing um, proactively? I mean, and obviously we are doing things proactively, you know, with our social emotional um, director and you know and all those things, but but I'm just I'm just curious: is this new students or new experiences of students? Yeah, it's it's the trend. Every school system is feeling it too, and I think the director of social emotional learning will be crucial to helping us develop programming because you know the, there are no health teachers in elementary school. It is the school nurse, and we need a lot of programming. We've also got another grant coming. I don't know if you want to mention that one. 
Oh, well, so it's going to go down to elementary, right? right. You're starting so in middle school, but that will... the Youth Opioid Prevention Grant right now, we're starting with yeah. the middle school with this first mm -hmm. 5000 and so we're, we're getting that, them trained. The way that we wrote the grant, I think the reason we got it is we said we were also going to bring it down to elementary school. So I actually meet with the guidance counselors tomorrow morning and have already met with the nursing staff, and we're going to... Uh, the Life Skills Program starts in elementary. It starts grade 3 to 5, so we'll start that in the fall um, as well with the next... Uh, round of funding for that so hopefully we can start that in third fourth and fifth grade well thank you again for you know for everything you do with our students every day thank yeah, you for thanks. your support thank you very much it's always a great presentation every year it really puts it in context how much work you guys actually do so thank you very much I'd really like to compliment and commend our nursing staff for their willingness as well as our guidance counselors for their willingness to all work together and collaborate. Um, working with our ETLs and special ed directors really looking at this whole initiative as well as really the town of North Andover and all of you sitting here with you know being willing and open to listen about having a director of social emotional learning because that really puts us at the forefront of addressing these um, considerable concerns that we have for our children and for the students within our town. So I'd like to thank you all as well as you for, you know, the movement we're making and really tackling this right from the outset. And, and for those who've been on the committee a little longer, if you remember when we took the director of special education and made a assistant superintendent for student services, the collaboration that you heard tonight was one of the impetuses for that work, is mm -hmm. that you know nurses need to work with guidance counselors, need to work with special educators, need to work with our psychologists, and that is really the holistic approach that we will continue to support through the director of social emotional learning. But that subtle change that we made a year and a half ago is absolutely on display tonight. Thank you. I don't think so. so someone, needs, someone needs to stay for a couple more, I think. I don't know. Okay. Uh, first reading of the annual review of health policies. Um, Are we going to go over this now, or, or so just the, the first? Just, yeah, just the first. Just, just the first reading, but please. Right. Go ahead. So it's the first reading of the wellness policy, and then our health advisory committee meeting that was last week, two weeks ago. Um, Erica Murphy, the food service director, she was um, um, audited this year, and one of the findings was they asked for a few changes to the wellness policy. So. These are really Erica Murphy's changes, and it has to do with just adding in the nutrition standards paragraph on page two. And on the last page, um, they want to make sure that we post our um, meetings on our website and invite the public to attend. So those are really the three changes um, for the wellness policy. Okay. Our policies subcommittee have anything to add to this? <laughs> That's kind of a joke. There. Sorry. I can look at that. Right. Shush. <laughs> so mean. Is the bullet point Did on, you shush me? <laughs> on recess before lunch, is that new? Or has that been in there? I'm looking under four, bullet two. When it's, when it's able to happen because of the schedule, I don't is think all the schools can do it. I think a few schools have it. Yeah. yeah. Whenever yeah. possible, it's a better yeah. way to have idea. things. No, I yes. love that idea. I think that's great. I remember, I, I don't know if you had already left Mr. Gilligan or when it happened, but Thompson shifted from having recess after to having recess before, I know, several years ago. What was the effect of that? Um, they seemed more ready to eat. What I had heard is a lot of times the kids wanted to get outside so badly, they would shove in some stuff, pack up the stuff, and run outside and not really eat their And then come to us with a stomach ache. Right. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening is kids would go eat lunch, then they'd go outside, and then they'd have a disagreement about the score of the football game or a kickball or a four square, and that would carry over into class. So when they did that, it went to recess first. There was not only other reasons why to do it, but they'd also come back to lunch, have lunch, wind down, and then back to class ready to learn. It doesn't happen in every school only because like at Franklin School, for example, we have two grade levels at one lunch period, and we were finding if everybody was at lunch at the same time, the line was too long, and, right. and students weren't didn't have enough time to eat. So we split it, so all grade 
you know, two and three have that period. Grade two is eating lunch, grade three is at recess, and then they flip. And I can say personally the injuries have decreased because there's less wild, crazy, you know, behavior during recess with all that many kids. It's right. just much more controlled, and the cafeteria is much calmer and conducive to socialization and pleasant eating. Yes. No, that makes sense. Is it but possible to encourage that in all the schools? Yeah, I mean, the research is pretty clear on this, and if we could make it happen, um, principals are trying to do it. But you're talking just about volume of students. But it's really, yeah, and I mean, it starts at 11 o'clock. In order mm -hmm. to get everybody, yeah, yes, the challenge to start at 9 o'clock or something. Right. Huh. Okay. Well, that was just the first reading of this for the discussion. We'll have that on the uh, on the 15th. Okay, first reading, annual appointment of school physician. Ms. Barzak. <laughs> and Dr. Chan. <laughs> Hello. He's here. <laughs> Oops. Dr. Chan, our school physician. Um, it's a great resource for us. He comes to our health advisory committee meetings as well as writes um, our um, orders that we need to have, our standing orders, or medical directives, they're called, as well as our first aid protocols. Um, and he also has a meeting with the nurses every year, and it just happened last month at our, um, uh, our staff meeting, basically our two-hour-long staff meeting, where he will go over topics that we have. And because his practice is local, he knows what's going on and what medical issues are, are happening in the communities. And we have some really great discussion and a lot of guidance he provides to us as far as what protocols we should be using and some of our decision making. And again, um, I think it's Kathleen that says, you know, I'm, I'm in the nurse's office with a stethoscope and Band-Aids and I have to make these, you know, sometimes really big decisions. And so we are able to talk with him about them. Mm -hmm. um, he also helps with some parents when we have um, some complicated medical issues and he's willing to talk to parents about how the this, this student can best be uh, treated in the schools. Um, so we're so happy that we continue yeah. to have them year after year. Dr. Chen, we have a couple of new members this year. Maybe you could tell a little bit about yourself and oh, sure. your uh, practice and whatnot. Yeah, uh, I'm Dr. Kenny Chan. I've been, I think, school physician since 2000, <laughs> 2002 or so. Um, so it's been for a while. It's been always a pleasure, um, you know, working with this group. Um, I practice locally, just right next to the Y at Andover Pediatrics, so we have quite a, uh, a, a few uh, North Andover uh, kids coming to our practice as well, so we kind of know what's going on in the community. Um, it's been a real privilege to work with this group of nurses. I'm also the Andover uh, uh, school physician as well, so I have a little bit of perspective, and I really must say, you know, not to you know say anything about Andover, but I think you this can. Is a we do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> this is a wonderful group. Um, they're uh, intelligent. Whenever they call me about problems or things going on, uh, they're very well informed. Uh, you know, they're very th very well thought out questions for me. They keep me on my toes. Um, sometimes I'm learning from them. Um, they're very proactive. Just like I mean, with these presentations, you can tell they're very progressive very proactive um, and most of most importantly they're dedicated they're all you know really the quintessential nurse um, so it's been my pleasure really for the last you know 15 years or so to, to be working with them and I hope I can continue to do it for many years to come Thank you. So. any questions for Dr. Chan Helen or Amy no? No? No. No. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing this is the first reading we'll, we'll actually vote next Time, I'm okay. sure it's going to be okay. So okay. you don't need to come back <laughs> unless I hear something differently. We appreciate your your, your time oh, and your effort. If you effort. hear something differently, should I come? Next <laughs> <time>? <laughs> I think you'd be okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank All you right. very Thank much. You very what much. You do. Thank all you. Right. Thanks. Fantastic think, job. Thank you. I think um, Thank you. I think you're all set, Cheryl. Okay. Another round of order. I know. You really, really put you your luck today. I am. All right, uh, we're going to skip down to new business F, the discussion of N A E Y C. That's what you said, right? A E Y C accreditation. From Jimmy sure. Rogers. So I just want to uh, frame this a little bit. So if you all, for those of you who are new, um, and Judy will talk about this, N A E Y C was uh, something that we needed to do as part of the kindergarten grant. And if you just remember, the kindergarten grant has dried up from the state. Um, we also had a little bit of uh, trouble with the process. Uh, if you remember, the Kittredge School had a hard time with parent response rates, which created all sorts of 
tricky situations for us. So just to frame this, I did ask Judy Rogers to kind of look at whether or not we want to continue with NAEYC accreditation and be able to uh, have a conversation about um, the cost and the benefit of it. Um, it was pretty clear what the benefit was for when we had the grant. It's a little harder to understand what the benefit is um, in terms of the cost without the grant. So I asked you to just come and have a conversation. I think it would be helpful that if we had an informed conversation about this rather than me just making an individual decision because there is a public outside facing part of this. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Thanks, Jen. So starting in, um, we first went through the accreditation process, I believe it, it was in 2011. And the way the process works is once you become accredited, your accreditation lasts for five years. In the fifth year, you apply for reaccreditation, which we just did last year for all of the schools. But in each year in between, you have to write an annual report on your, that you're maintain, how you're maintaining an accreditation, and you have to pay for it. So the, none of it is gratis. You pay for every step of the way. Mm -hmm. um, so just for those of you that are new to the committee, it stands for the National um, association for the education of young children so when I brought this up with the principals we came up with our own little um, acronym North Andover educates young children so we can <laughs> you know still keep it but use it in our own way um, so the annual reports the total cost would be 3050 because it has gone up it's increased a lot and I believe the total amount uh, last year for the renewal and the reaccreditation was um, close to 10,000 and uh, what has happened with the state is it's pretty interesting and I think this is what caused me to pause and think about it the state realizes realizes that it's expensive for districts to maintain accreditation I mean we have five elementary schools but imagine a big district that has 10 or 15 it's you have to do it per school per program so um, what they came up with, and I think it's online for you to look at, it's um, called the Elements of a High Quality Kindergarten. Yeah. And that was developed mm -hmm. by um, a group of kindergarten coordinators like myself. It was taken from, a lot of it was taken from the accreditation guidelines. And it really talks about what a, what a good kindergarten, full day kindergarten looks like. And what their recommendation was is that programs that are not becoming accredited use this as a sample when they're developing curriculum, working with families, and setting up classrooms, to just to look at those guidelines and just kind of follow them. And so that's what they're recommending. They're not saying that we have to be accredited. So that's kind of where we're at right now. We don't have to be accredited. And we could, it would be a huge savings to the district, obviously. The other thing that uh, the Department of Education has done is they developed a uh, program quality work group, and they're looking at three areas of early childhood. One is an elementary principal support group. One is a group that's working on social emotional learning, which you've just heard 30 minutes talked about because that's running uh, amok in all of, all of the grade levels. And the other one is to develop a uh, position on play in early childhood. Mm. So um, coincidentally, I'm part of this group. I have a meeting tomorrow. Um, and it's been really interesting, some of the information that's come out of it. It's uh, how to discipline young children. So it's really all, the whole thing is about how do you have really good practice in kindergarten and do it, do it well, do it correctly. and. Um, I personally, after doing this for many, many years, all my life I've been an early childhood educator, I believe that we can do this without being accredited because I think it's a lot of it is good common sense. The one requirement of accreditation that the teachers really do like, and Cheryl told me that it's going to be a requirement, the ratio is going to change in 2018, they do like the CPR training, but I think that's a minimal uh, piece that we could maintain for the teachers. Um, so I think, uh, I mean, it's, it's up to the, you know, obviously the committee and Jen, but I, I personally feel that the teachers are in a good place right now. They do understand what a good quality kindergarten looks like. 
and I think it's been nice having the accreditation because I think they've learned so much from it, but I don't personally feel that it's necessary. So just so we're clear, the, the impetus behind getting credit was to get the kindergarten grant from the state? It was a requirement, a requirement of the grant. Right, yes. right. And how long ago was that about? about five they years. cut the grant last year no, for the first No, but when did they start? When did we start? When did we oh, do my the, gosh. Well, districts started getting the grant in... It's Pre been over a decade. Yeah, yeah, it's been, I, yeah it's been a long time. And the accreditation piece came along about oh six, seven years yeah, ago. Yeah, that sounds right. Right, right. And I, I mean, I, we went through it last year as a full district. It's a, also the, the other cost that we haven't time talked about at all is it's a ton of time. We had to do a lot of our t professional development for our teachers was mm -hmm. in getting the portfolios, getting everything together. Um, and even the yearly reports, it just feels like it's a lot of it reporting is. out. It's not really changing practice. And so... Um, our feeling was that, um, you know, as I said last year, because we knew at last year that the grant was probably going to not continue, I didn't yeah. want us to drop this accreditation. We had one school that was in risk of not being accredited. All of our schools are accredited. We're in good standing. These are the times when you decide whether or not it's useful, not when one of them is struggling. But, so. but the reason, correct me wrong, the reason the Kittredge School went through, I mean, as my son was just going to Kittredge, and it caused... Not for, for my family, but I'm sure for a lot of new families, some stress like, what do you mean my kindergartner's not going to go to a credit? Exactly. I mean, that, that was going on. Exactly. Um, and it, was, it seemed like it was just because there was enough responses to a, a survey, which, you know, if you look at it like that, well, you lose accreditation because you didn't get enough response. Uh, it didn't seem like... It was very bureaucratic. It was. It for was. lack of a better word. And what, what I would like to do is, once we make a decision, I would like to put the elements of a high-quality kindergarten on the kindergarten website. Let, let parents see what the expectation is so when they walk into a class, oh, that's why the teacher squats down and looks eye-to-eye -eye in the child's face. That's why they wash their hands before uh, they eat. It's just common sense, good practice. Mm -hmm. That's why they ask them to wear an extra coat when it's freezing or they don't go outside when it's zero degrees. All of the things that are in accreditation really are, so many of them have to do with good common sense. Yeah, and I, I just think, you know, that was last last uh, fall and I don't think really anything really changed because the, the sur more surveys came in. I mean, I think you probably remember I called up Miss Farr during right. during opening day, but she better do a good job, and and she has done a great job. Jack's, Jack's had a great, fantastic year at Kittredge, uh, kindergarten Miss Farr's class. But uh, I, I I was always a little suspect of it that it was just a, like I said a bureaucratic thing. Mm -hmm. We needed to have it for to get the grant. So the North one thing, yeah, that's why that's why we were looking at those letters. So we can make them work in another way. The one thing Judy's not saying is although it was awesome to do the accreditation initially. Uh, it really helped us put a lot of things together. The amount of time that took away from her job as the kindergarten coordinator doing the mid-cycle of the review uh, that we had to do at all the different schools was just enormous. Uh, and same with the principals. And this high-quality elements guide from the state really provides the lens for all teachers to prepare practice and uh, lessons and what's the best experiences for kindergartners. So it's one last question, Judy. Um, do you see this becoming happening in other communities too that people are saying it's not really worth having the accreditation if you're not getting the grant anymore there are several communities that got the grant that refused to go through the process they fought it tooth and nail so um we chose not to take that path right. we went the accreditation path and like jen said you know last year it was sort of we renewed but then we had to we had that pivotal decision to make. What are we going to do? We have one school that didn't get accredited. We want, we're so inclusive here about everyone. We wanted everyone to be sure. to feel like they were on board. And, and, and I will tell you, the teachers have made this work. Mm -hmm. If you ask any of them what the 10 standards are, they're going to tell you what they are, what they mean. They communicate well with parents, whether it's through blogs or newsletters. Some of them are uh, on Twitter now. They're doing what these elements say to do. I, right. I firmly believe that. Um, having the sticker on the, on the, on the school. Yeah. You and know, you said, you said it's, it's $10,000, is that what you said, approximately? Or is uh, it that's three, last year. That's 10. what we spent. For the big, for, for the whole, so is that for built, the is that, is that built into this year's budget, that, the, the accreditation too, that, that 10000 so it's about, what, it's a little over $3,000. It's over, year. it's, th yeah, it's $3,000. No. It's, it's, it's not a big number, but it's. And the other thing, that I have to tell you is if we keep it, 
when the new building opens, we have to do it all over again because it won't matter because those five separate entities won't be separate entities anymore. So it will cost to start at the beginning again. Is that, is that a vote we have to take? So right. that so. was something we um, wondered. I mean, I don't, I don't know if accreditation is a school committee decision. I think it would be um, just smart for it to be reaffirmed by the school okay. committee that we are not going to seek reaccreditation re because I, I um, sure. however, we were wondering if it had to be an official vote, but I thought but it would we just be, uh, we would, so that was something we didn't quite know. Let's talk about that a bit further. Okay. So supposing we decided not to go forward with pursuing the accreditation, what would you and uh, kindergarten teachers in our district do differently other than not do some paperwork? in terms of their educating our children? Uh, spend more time talking about what the elements of a high quality kindergarten are. So for example, um, one of the things that we wanted to spend a lot of time on is how we can talk about purposeful play in the classroom. Because when you say the word play, people think, oh, it's just free play, they're not doing anything. But there's a way to do play, to connect it to the standards, and we really haven't had sufficient time to have those good conversations, mm -hmm. and we would like to. So it's those kinds of those kinds right. of things. So it's not like you suddenly stop doing things that are required or, or outlined as good education because we're not going for their accreditation. Just wouldn't bother going through the process. Nothing really would change at all, other than, huh, because <laughs> you know. And that's one of the things that they always say to you is they can make a surprise visit, and so that's always like in the back of every kindergarten teacher's mind. What if they come in the classroom, you know? You know, nobody wants a visitor in the middle of the day that's unexpected, but, um, you know, they would have to get their portfolio out and show it to them and keep it updated. Again, that's paperwork. They have spent hours putting these portfolios together. Uh, we have one school that did it all in a binder, and all the other four, they're all electronic. So um, it was, it was a, lot of, a lot of staff development time, a lot of work, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. So I'm a bit of an idealist, and I, I like to think that the state's going to bring the grant back at some point. Um, you keep thinking that, Mr. <laughs> I, I will. So my question would be, um, if the grant were to come back, would, it, would we be at any disadvantage for having let this lapse? No. If this grant came back, <laughs> I doubt this would ever be a part of it. Okay. Because there was so much pushback from districts that this right. was a, a very arduous part of the grant that didn't have a po that much impact in a positive way. And, and you said there were people who got the grant that never did the accreditation anyways, right? No. They yeah. went so we, through we, self-study and never followed yeah, through. Like that. So. Just to be clear, what they've done, it, along with some of the work around teaching strategies gold, right. uh, they had several initiatives that were all the communities invested in, and they ended up going with teaching strategies goals around assessment and curriculum. That died, too. They got rid of that, and they pulled that. So it's... Um, that's why we're trying to just do what's right for young children. And I don't disagree with that. Yeah. I just think that it's important to know if we're putting ourselves at a disadvantage for any reason. Um, I, I, I don't think so. I don't, th I don't think it would come back. I would, be, I would be shocked if it came back. Yeah, especially with the, the deficits they're showing already, the lack of tax revenue this year. So. Governor Baker was pretty clear. Yeah. Well, he's not the, the last <laughs> voice on that, but I think looking at the, the projections, I think they have, they have a lot more cuts to come. Well, yeah. no, no, nothing. And I think that's just why they've developed this program quality work group because they know that the elements can be, can happen in a classroom if they work with principals, if they look at social emotional learning, and if they really look at play. So I think that's why they've divided those, made those three areas their focus. Well, and I, th I think too, I mean, our communication is very good here. So I mean, one of the things that, you know, an accreditation process requires is that you, you know, you do your assessments and you do reporting um, periodically. But I feel like with the communication we got from you, with, with the obvious communication we're going to need with opening a new kindergarten, um, you're going to be in here telling us about, you know, how these um, high quality kindergarten, um, you know, things are, are taking place, how the elements are being incorporated. So I feel like we're going to hear from you and that will be um, important. I think that'll be great. So is it safe to assume, and we can talk about policies and procedures here, but is it, I mean, my gut has been, I think our gut has been to say, okay, enough of NAEYC accreditation, especially with the, all the work we're going to have to do in opening the new building. I just want to make sure that that is a general sentiment of support from the school committee on that decision. Maybe we'll get, maybe we'll get a legal opinion. 
from the, the Tom attorney afterwards. If okay. Think about on it. All right. But I just want to. But I think you're getting the sense, and you know, yep. Mr. McDevitt's not here. I, I feel. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Judy. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Judy. Much. Thanks. Thank you, Mary Lou. And that's a nice transition for Attorney Egan to join us. We're going to take um, the first reading of the annual approval of student handbooks out of order next. So um, just to set this up a little bit, um, uh, we did not approve student handbooks last year as a school committee. Um, and the reason we did not do that is that um, the policy here in North Andover has been that each school has their own handbook. Um, there has been some consistency among the elementary um, uh, not really consistency, uh, respectfully, in a lot of ways between the elementary, the middle, and the high school. Um, and so one of the ideas I had coming in as a superintendent was, especially with the ever-changing laws, um, that it would be really great to have a single student handbook for the entire district. Um, we thought about doing that last spring, but then knew we were going to have an attorney come on to pay, we have to pay an outside attorney to help us redraft our entire handbook would have been, as uh, Attorney Egan will tell you, yeoman's task and a huge bill. <laughs> so we thought um, once uh, the town attorney came on uh, and got her feet wet uh, that we would ask her to start working on this. So the concept here is a full student handbook that ref uh, that goes to every single so that applies to every kid in the district um, and I had tasked Mr. Gilligan uh, and he's going to set this up uh, with trying to figure out how to do that because it's not easy it's taking uh, seven different handbooks asking everyone to kind of agree on a philosophical component and um, and it's uh, it's been a lot of work so you put a committee together and I take it from here Mr. I'll be happy Egan. to help explain uh, attorney Egan's been great and she's um, really done a wonderful job we've had several meetings this spring and typically uh, when we've come before the school committee in the past we've come before you to highlight some changes and we cover what the changes are in the handbook I would say the challenge here is um, exactly what dr. price said we wanted to get one handbook to provide more consistency and the way we tackled it this year was we wanted to get all the common components that are in all, were, used to be in all three handbooks around federal law, state law, you know, uh, bullying prevention, uh, residency policy, put all those things so that it's common all the way through. The change that you'll see tonight, which is not much of a change, is we took the code of conduct uh, around discipline and some of the consequences, and what we've done is we've incorporated in the handbook under high school, middle school, and elementary school, could, because certainly what's age appropriate right. um, to discipline a first grader may be very different uh, from another. Um, so Attorney Egan was tasked with putting this together. She's done remarkable work, and what you really see here is um, at the middle school and elementary school, not very much change. I think as we have another year to work on this, we might even be able to combine some of these uh, codes together to be more, um, you know, with some high, with some uh, asterisks around, this might be more of a secondary. But um, the real big change is we've imported the high school code of conduct, the middle school and the elementary in separate sections. And I'll just point out, I think the most significant change is, um, you know, I left the high school 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, I think handbooks have to also reflect the community values. Um, once I left the high school, there was some review and, the former principal of the high school uh, had made some changes to some of the pieces. So um, in the handbook, there were some really harsh penalties around 10-day suspensions of school. Uh, and, and that was really problematic in a lot of ways because if you're a special education student, um, you, you know, and you, you, once you're suspended up to nine days, you have to have a manifestation determination hearing uh, and all these different pieces. So under the new laws, it really made sense to say, okay, what did, what did the community previously value? We talked to the high school administration about it, and instead of those 10-day suspensions, those then went, the, the big changes, they went back to five days, which is more appropriate in a lot of ways because 10 days is 18% of a trimester. Um, and it, you know, if a student's a special education inclusion student and, and, and made a mistake, it could really put them in jeopardy and, and have to follow some other procedures. So the nice part was going back to that, uh, and I'll let Attorney Egan take over after this, Short-term suspensions now in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is anything under the 10 days. There's no appeal on those, and those are considered short-term. If it's a more serious or egregious offense, um, you know, typically that's under what's called 37H and three quarters. Um, that typically would be a longer suspension. 
So we felt anything that was going to be over five days is something we'd probably look towards a longer, exp uh, a longer term ex uh, suspension versus the five days. So I think that's the most significant change you'll see. Um, and other than that, um, the middle school is primarily the same, the elementary. And it's been really nice working with administrators from middle school, high school, elementary school uh, for this input. And one of the high school administrators even sought some input from students at the high school, which was nice. So. Attorney Egan. Um, yeah. So I think that set up the, what we're trying to do here. And one of the things to keep in mind with this core handbook that doesn't necessarily just deal with the discipline and the conduct issue is that within the school committee's policies, there's one particular policy that says all of these and lists what has to be included in this handbook. And so that's essentially what I did is I went through the policies and I took them and I incorporated them into the handbook so that, and they're organized in a certain way and they organized in saying these are your rights and these are your responsibilities and then if you you know fail to live up to those responsibilities these are the consequences and that's when it goes into the discipline um, so there's the uh, the different handbooks from the previous years from the high school the middle school and the elementary school had these elements in them the language may have been different because everybody had their own sort of editing and or the tone may have been different for each particular school but essentially We've just taken those policies and incorporated it into this handbook. And I, I would say the other component is that there were some conversations as a district, especially around the code of conduct, of it's like, what's the point, right? Like, what are we trying to do? And even just the tenor of how each of the grade levels set up the point of a code of conduct was very different. Where at the elementary school, it was around good decision making and then at the middle school it was a lot of um, you know we really want to encourage but there's going to be some consequences and from my perspective at the high school it was don't or you will and mm -hmm. I felt like it we needed a, a more unified approach of we're an educational institution we're about teaching you responsible decision making and that should be some a thread that goes pre-k to 12. And kids are going to make mistakes. Yeah, you know, it's teachable. It, it, it provides for more of a teachable moment. Adults make mistakes as well. Mm. Yes. Every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On this side of the table. <laughs> there, there was also, um, uh, Attorney Egan and I did talk about, um, there was an issue at the middle school earlier this year around um, uh, saluting the flag um, and the right to, to, to not uh, that salute the flag. And so we did incorporate some of that and just in terms of the rights right and really there's there's federal law and there's cases that do that so this is an opportunity for us to have one document where we have that exact you know obviously um, we have and we do in this town salute the flag on a very regular basis but there is case law that says if a student does not want to do that we cannot force them to do that that is their their legal right and we need to just be respectful of people's um, and kids' decision making on that. So there's an example of something we would have then had to go put in a whole bunch of different handbooks. Now we have them in one Page place. 19. Yep. Um, so there's a lot to digest here. Yes, um, there is. So this is always just a first reading. Um, I expect we're going to put it on for a second reading ne next uh, in two weeks. With that being said, um, if there's a lot to change and a lot to, you know, discuss, then uh, we'll probably have a, you know, a third reading of it, you know. So I don't even feel like um, we're trying to jam this this through. Okay. So I, I think yeah. that might have been your concern. We just, um, we just the reason we put it on, it, literally, we were working on this until you got it, um, um, is that we only have one more scheduled school committee meeting. Right. So we'd like to open the year if we could with a rights and responsibilities handbook. Understanding it might not be perfect, we could then find another time if we did need an yeah. additional time. But that's why we put it on today. Mm -hmm. yeah, we'll probably, I mean, obviously. Well, historically, we'll see what the, the new chair, whoever they may be, um, decides to do. Um, but we meet in July usually and right. have that retreat, so we could we could vote that then. That would give you plenty of time. Correct? Yeah, we're pretty close. I think there are some edits on this. You know, for instance, we have the wrong mission statement at the top. I, we had an updated mission statement. And the more of those things that we can catch, um, it would be great. Um, we'd like any feedback. At this point, um, we've asked the principals to give us feedback, we've given feedback, and now we were really hoping that the school committee could give us a community uh, feedback on it. Um, so I would suggest that, that if that's the case, um, th this is more of a working document. Uh, over the next couple of weeks before our meeting, if, if you come across stuff, let us know so we can make those changes in advance. Um, so when 
maybe we can approve it on the 15th. That'd be the goal, but if not, that's this fine too. Was, um, this was an attachment on the agenda too, so yeah. anybody in the public that wanted to read yeah. it and it was a late give attachment feedback, yeah. Yeah. you but know, it's currently attached. It's currently attached, correct. Right. Currently um, attached. And so it's really best if we look at this without comparing it to any of those old existing pieces because that's too complicated and confusing. You've done all that. Exactly. Exciting yes. stuff. Right. Yes. That's what she gets paid the big bucks. That's right. Parts of it you think would be appropriate, most appropriate for the school committee. I mean, a lot of it's their policies that you've already adopted. Right. Exactly. So it almost all of it is uh, is that is the policies that you've already adopted. And the only sort of the only thing that is not is the pledge of allegiance policy, which is on the page 18, and that's that's um, responding to the statute, which requires the pledge, and it also is with the. The case law, which says that you can't call out or discriminate against somebody who does not want to um, participate in that activity, and then the only other aspect, or the other aspect of it, is that discipline. And what we've done is we've taken, as has been previously stated, is the three different schools um, and combined those into one right. document. So that's what I would suggest probably looking. And, we, and we'd also like to know. I mean, this is the first time we've put it all together. So are there things that we can do organizationally that would make it more accessible yeah, to families and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff? Because this is a significant change for our district to have one place. Mm -hmm. um, so we'd like it to be accessible to families. I think it'll be a welcome. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Um, yeah imagine good. if you have a child in each school and you can just read one handbook and sign right, all right. those documents. It's much right. easier. Any other further comments? I'm just wondering, is sure. there, do you, I guess it's really for you, Dr. Price, foresee from the elementary principals or middle school or high school, are there any things that, are they going to want to put an overlay at the front or addenda or anything like that? So what we've typically done is the elementary handbook's been the same for a few years now, four or five years, where the difference was, was the, um, you know, the first couple pages was real specific to the school around, car, you know, car drop off. Right, 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 right. Those are things that the principals feel like they can communicate separately. Probably or as part easier. of a registration or a orientation, beginning of the year stuff. The, the big change is Suzanne's work, streamlining, making sure all the right policies are in elementary, middle, and high, and they're the same. And a lot like handbooks over the years, you know, some years they've come to school committee, others they have not. You know, Suzanne's found some things that may have been left over from the law 15 years ago that just survived. And her ability to weed out the stuff that's no longer appropriate mm -hmm. uh, has been great and make sure we're up to date because there had been significant changes in some of the laws a few years ago um, and she's made sure we have them all in there so that's awesome so um, in districts that do this, they actually just kind of have one and they post it on all of the different websites and then people can refer to that and, that's and right. it kind of takes the pressure off of individual principals to spend some of their summer time making sure it's updated right. and trying to find out well what is the latest on the law and did the right. school committee change a policy slightly that I now need to change so right. no that's great so then theoretically you go to the website for NAMS you look at the student handbook or I mean the, the um, policy document and then if there's something specific to things that happen then that's a separate attachment entirely or a separate link or a separate mm -hmm. topic yeah perfect okay. and really she's imported the, the like I said the, and I don't want to harp on the discipline piece but that's that's really the part that parents go to the most mm -hmm. uh, typically at a high school level if there's something that happens um, she's imported the elementary and cleaned that up same with the middle school and the really only change is at the high school I think it was out of whack compared to uh, it, it, it was not aligned with what most districts have, um, and it just seemed um, much more appropriate mm -hmm. uh, over long discussions with the administrators. Right. I think having that discussion was really important because we did – the elementary principals were very engaged in this process, and they, they certainly wanted their um, con code of conduct and discipline process in that, so we included that. Okay. And because they all wanted it to be completely appropriate for their schools. And we did drill down to some of the issues, as was stated earlier. Some of the policies that were stated in the handbook may have been um, previous handbooks were not up to date. And so as we were creating this and incorporating it, then that gave us the opportunity to really drill down and find out what right. was appropriate for the handbook. Okay. That's good. Okay. Thank you, Great. Attorney. Great. That's a lot. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. I'm sure if we have questions, we'll get back to you. Okay. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for your patience. Um, well, let's hang out on new business for one more issue. The first reading annual approval of student activity accounts. Let's do that next. That uh, Mr. Mealy. Yeah. Uh, term annual is a little misleading. This is the first <laughs> annual. <laughs> so 
when we had our audit, our student activity account audit done last year, uh, one of the recommendations that came out of that audit was that the school committee annually approve the student activity accounts. Um, so that's what we're looking to do. And um, attached to this was a list of accounts, and you can see them. They're all different sizes. Most of them at the high school, but each school has some type of student activity account. Um, and so it just the list needs to be approved by the school committee. And this is a comprehensive list that all the principals have gone to you that they have? This is Correct. all inclusive? This, this is the existing accounts, um, and we are removing um, or have removed the previous year class accounts that no longer exist. Um, we're obligated to close those out in a certain amount of time, and so that's why you don't see them. And if, um, w if there's an account that is missing that's not listed here, would we have to approve it later? Is that what we would have to do? We would have to okay. approve it. So we're just going to assume it. that this, this is a comprehensive list. Exactly, okay. yes. That seems pretty s straightforward. Any, any discussion on that? They're just organized by whatever account number they've been assigned. Correct. So there's no other grouping to Correct. understand. Okay. Okay. So, I don't know if there's a difference, for example, between BRC and RAISE. There are two different accounts. And some of these things don't mean anything to me. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm supposed to approve this, I guess I feel like I maybe need to know what it means, or I need to know that somebody knows what it means. Like AMS, I don't know what that means. I don't know why BRC and RAISE have two different accounts. I don't know if somebody else has that. Or if I need to know that. Yeah, no, I'd say you probably don't, but um, I can certainly get you the information um, that kind of summarizes each account. I would say, uh, Ms. Picard, maybe, um, you know, go through this list, because, again, this is a first reading, and if there's ones that you have um, questions about or concerns about or just want to know what the heck they mean. Like, I don't know what, I don't know what AMS stands for either. Lab, Most math and science at the middle school. That's our seventh grade math program. Smart. Because um, mo <laughs> I think most of them are most of them looking at them quickly are self-explanatory, and maybe right. maybe I, Mr. Meeting get it. Right. Those are the ones that I have right. questions okay. about. Okay, that sounds fair enough. Okay, that's also, it. one other thing is so you've got Kittredge General, Kittredge Library, Franklin General, Franklin Library, Thompson. Like, is there a names and why? What? This, cause yeah, they, they, they might all not decide have, their own thing. Yes. That's so they've all kind of applied for. Gosh, I'd like a new account. Exactly. And you award. Right. It. Okay. Yeah. So you can see things come up just out of need. Um, high school locks. You know, there's <laughs> kids lose them or and have to reimburse, so the money goes into that account. That account. Right. So principals each school they set up the, these accounts by themselves with your help or. They will set them up right with, you know, they'll ask us and um, we'll set them up. Um, okay. And then the money comes in. Our transportation coordinator actually is the student activity account coordinator as well, as far as uh, keeping all the accounts and um, cutting any checks. Right. So I. Sorry. Really strict regulations about student accounts, I, about student activity accounts. So um, they're, uh, they're very highly regulated in terms of how the money, what you spend it on and how right. it goes in and out. It's not a it's not a revolving door. Right. So then when a, yeah. so when a request comes or a, a principal spends money on something then you code it against this when it's approved or what have you. Correct. Or students. There's, spend, a, there's just actually like any other a monthly report account. for all the I remember accounts. looking at those, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. For them to reconcile. Right. And the majority are of the high school. Yeah. Correct. Well there's so many clubs and yeah. all right. And we've eliminated cash on almost everything. Dances. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mealy. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to old business superintendent evaluation. I think uh, Dr. Price has submitted um, a couple documents for us to review, and I think um, I know I took a crack at the evaluation form. Uh, has anyone else had a chance to? I didn't know if we were allowed to start doing that or. I read them. Yeah. So we were supposed to start populating that. Yes, well, you can. We gave it to you. Well, <laughs> if you remember, uh, Ms. Zagari gave it to you in a number of different formats. Right. Wondering if you liked the Google form that you could just fill it out. Um, so I think what you, you might want to do is um, determine what format you want to use. Um, I, thought that looked, I thought that was easier, but right. I didn't want to make any decisions for you. It's so much easier than last year's. 
format. I will say that. If you just use the Google, yeah. the Google form, yes. I thought so. Okay. I thought so. So when we press the submit button, where does that go to? Uh, to Bev. To Bev, okay. Mm -hmm. So do we have a deadline for getting that? Um, well, ideally we'd like to have it, um, well, we, is it the 15th our last meeting for the year? It or, is our or, or last schedule. Yeah, we should have done meeting. And according to my contract, um, we have to agree if your eval my evaluation is going to go past uh, July 1. Right. Right. So we really need to get it done. We can agree to I, go past. No. I'm just saying that's the. I, I, I took a crack at it already. I will tell you that I, I think I, I had a lot more issues last year doing it. Um, I think if you haven't done it already or, or attempted to look at it, if you think it's going to take longer, let me know. But if you can do it within a week, I think that will give you plenty of time to you know, tally it all up and, and put it together as one document. For the next put, meeting, yeah. For the next meeting. If that sounds, I mean, I'm sure Andrew will um, acquiesce to that. If, okay. But what do you, how do you feel, Helen, about so, that? So one thing that I noticed was that page two and three were on the on the one that I looked at there like you said there were several things to look at um, the the page two and three goals were all from the last um, from last year so it had things like um, the entry evaluation so or she the gave entry. you my last year's one so yeah. you could see right. um, what the format was like yeah the one that we're saying that you would use would actually be the Google form that has this year's goal so what, okay what, what, all right what so I, I may not have looked at so, so do this why, okay. don't, why don't you take a look at the, the Google one because it's it, again it's a, it's a lot easier to use and if you think that um, that meets your needs to evaluating I mean I know it's only been again a couple of months for you too but I, I like to think that you've had more experience with dr. price you know that you could probably answer a lot of the questions anyways yeah no I thought that I mean most of it looked you know very yeah. reasonably reasonable to do it was just the I I didn't find um, when I looked um, that this year's goals I found last year's goals so I might have just been looking at the wrong and, and this year's goals is what I provided you exactly all of that exactly yeah right. Right. so I would say that if, if, if folks could um, you know get that done within the week um, that would give me and Bev a week to put it all together mm -hmm. have Bev time put it together <laughs> and you said it has to be done in one sitting or it won't save what was that line about um, so on a Google form I think one of the challenges is I, I Bev did this so I, I'm anxious I'll have her clarify with you on I did it in one tomorrow. sitting so I didn't take that risk okay <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm like, I think I, I think once off? you do a Google form does anyone know I think because it's on a Google form I think once you hit submit it's a problem to go back to it that's or correct. if you walk away without hitting submitted, that's what I'm about. says save and resume later. That's what, yeah. Let me have Bev send you an email that. clarifying I so. that. But I, I, I really think that it, it's not, you know, you're not blocking off half the day to do it. Okay. Uh, you know, I think, I like to think that you, you look at the questions the first time, go through the whole thing, and I mean, it's a lot of, you know, click the buttons and, you know, write a few comments, and I'm sure you can do it in one sitting. I have the utmost confidence in you that you can do it. You don't know how many interruptions I get. <laughs> oh, well, actually, no, so with, with TJ and Lauren, maybe. Actually, more Rob, I think, actually. <laughs> but I can absolutely have Bev just clarify that and send you an email. And if you have questions about it, just contact Bev. Yeah. Great. Um, Okay. Although I may not want you to take her advice on how you should rate me because she. Um, well, well, she was on vacation when you said it. That's why I didn't. Because <laughs> yeah, I think there might be a lot of needs improvement if you ask her. <laughs> well, and I, I do think that if for any reason we needed more time, um, isn't the 29th a Thursday? Um, so there'll be two weeks between the 15th sure, and the 29th. Sure. But yeah, take, if a, we need take a crack at it and see if we can bang it out. I have you know? a wedding of a cousin at 10 o'clock. So that's not going to work. In New Jersey. Yeah, no, no that's I'm not going to work. All right, do. so that's just good to know. <laughs> yeah. We'll get so it done. I think, I think you'll be able to get it done. away that Thursday also. But if we do need more time, it just clearly on my contract says that we have to agree that it'll be right. after July right. 1. So okay. it's an agreement. Very good. Old business B FY seventeen budget status report, Mr. Mealy. Yep. And so, <laughs> not surprisingly, not much has changed since last. We're continuing with the closeout for the year. Um, I will draw your attention to one change, and that is that the um, two hundred thousand dollars from the special education stabilization fund is now reflected in this report, and you can see it at the bottom where. We used to be forty-five million two hundred twenty-six thousand one hundred forty-one. We're now forty-five million two hundred four hundred twenty-six thousand one forty-one. 
And, and we, we thank we thank the voters of special time meeting for doing that. That's right. We also are getting funds for the kindergarten grant that didn't come through too. Does that Have not come in yet, but yes. So we will be getting hundred and five thousand dollars that town kind of helped us with the bridge, if you remember, because the kindergarten grant didn't come in after we had approved our FY seventeen budget. So we will be getting another hundred and five. Correct. And that covers the salaries, the rest of the salaries for the kindergarten teaching assistants. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Mr. Mealy, just to, so folks can look at this, um, a general sense, I mean, we're in the closeout phase. Um, it's going to be tight. Yeah, we're still projecting that. You know, we needed that 200000 and we'll be at like a break even um, for the year. We won't be uh, generating any funds to use for prepay into the next year. Okay. So supposing, let's say, let's just take, Memberships, it's now at 100%. If you needed to suddenly spend more there, would you go to 104% there and then short somewhere else, or are you just, Doesn't you know, how does that work? That's yeah, what you would do, right? Happens, okay, yeah. like any budget you would Between make. lines, right, we right. had, okay. we. But you wouldn't stick it somewhere else just to, you would put it where it belongs and go over on that line and then be under exactly. somewhere else. Exactly, right. right. There are expenses um, that you'll see at the end will be over the 100%. Right. Right. But and others and others will right. remain under the 100. Right. To There's one already under tutors. Right. It's funny because I looked yep. for that specifically because I was curious. Okay. But because you want to really see where you're really spending your money so you can allocate differently. Right. Good. Yep. Okay. Any further questions? Seeing none. That concludes our old business. Um, we'll move back to public comment. No, public? No? Nothing at all? Okay. <laughs> Just taking it on. Anything <laughs> from the committee? Amy, anything? Um, try and remember. We can come back to you. I'm just excited for all the graduation festivities. Very exciting. Helen, anything? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Polly? I just wanted to commend the high school and Christy Morley on the capstone projects. The oh, yes. Capstone. Those were fantastic. Was I was so impressed. I only got to go to one day's worth. Um, but the ones I saw, I was extremely impressed with how well they did. Um, and that was really, I just wanted to give her a, a shout out. Can I, it's can I, David, can I Sure, ask? good. Um, the Memorial Day Parade was really fantastic, and I really have to commend um, our teachers and our students, and um, we have little tiny daisy girls um, that are in it, and, and, you know, all the way through the high school. Um, that parade is really made um, excellent by our youth and family participation, um, and it means a lot to our veterans that are with us and to families who have lost, um, you know, service members. Thank you, Ellen. That's absolutely, absolutely uh, appropriate. You I just want to say, oh, do you want to add something? Yeah, it's just, you know, I, I think, um, and I apologize for this, but, you know, we didn't recognize that we lost a staff member since yes. our last meeting. Um, oh. Carolyn Shera, a chemistry teacher at the high school, um, it's really uh, powerful when we took two buses worth of kids um, to her wake uh, last Friday. A uh, young teacher with a very young child, um, tragically uh, passed from a very aggressive cancer. Um, she didn't make it back in time to prep her kids for the AP chemistry and then um, did not return. So it was a very difficult time for the high school, difficult time for the high school science. Um, you know, in true North Andover fashion, um, people showed up to do substitutes. Mr. Gilligan was in charge of subs. Um, a lot of ECC staff went to the high school to cover for subs because when they had lost Jill Richards earlier this year, we all went to them. Um, and Although it was, we did put them in pairs. We did put them in pairs and they did some coloring. Um, but um, I just, I think we, I, I apologize I didn't um, say it earlier. I think that. Um, I think I think having a quick moment of silence would, would, be, would be appropriate. appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was just, just going to mention real quickly, I think the membership was given this uh, list of uh, colleges that our 2017 graduates are going to be attending, and it's quite an impressive list. Um, I think it speaks volumes of the quality of education that they're, they're getting at the high school, and I just want to commend all the graduates and their families for um, all the hard work they've done, and I hope they enjoy uh, the next uh, week of celebration. Safely. Safely. We also had a terrific one more thing. We also had a terrific Special Olympics. Oh, that's yeah, right. That's oh, so great, too. Okay. Um, 
That concludes the um, public session our meeting. Um, I would now um, entertain a, a motion to move into executive session under MGL Chapter 3821A to discuss strategy for negotiations with the North Andover Teachers Association and teaching assistants, and uh, we will not be coming back into public session. So moved. Second. Moved by Ms. Lynch, seconded by Ms. Mabley. Um, all those, uh, we'll give the work call. Ms. Lynch? Aye. Ms. Mabley? Aye. Ms. Picard? Aye. Mr. Tracy? Aye. So that's for a vote. We'll be going to executive session and we will not be coming back in. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.